everyone. Welcome. Um, we are doing an interview with um, Harry Shanahan and Sean Williams for Rebel Dykes. I'm also joined by Kat, who reviewed for Les Flix. It was a great time and a terrible time to be young and queer. Thatcher had just got in. Politically, there was always this attempt to silence. It was dangerous just to be who you were in those days. Let's kick off with how this project came about and more importantly when it started because I know obviously this has been quite a journey yeah it was yeah yeah it was donkey's years ago wasn't it so it started <laughs> because Siobhan Fahey our producer um was doing like an oral history project for um I think it was um was it LGBTQIA plus week Special um, thing. I think it was yeah, probably like History Month or something yeah, like that. Yeah, History but Month. It, it was primarily um, like a you know an in-person presentation, like an academic paper that she wanted filming. Um, but when she told me what it was about, and you know, I was already familiar with the Rebel Dykes and had been quite influenced by them, that I was like, this is amazing. This has to be a feature. Like, I'm not just putting ten minutes on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and it basically snowballed from there. And yeah. five years later, it's after a lot of blood, sweat and tears, it is here. Yeah, yeah. So Sean got me involved. Sean was like, oh, I think, you know, we've been talking about making a film together since we met, because we were both like big film fans and I'd yeah. been to like film school and stuff. So yeah, Sean was like, oh, come and help me make this film. And I was like, okay, what's it about? And then I was like, that sounds cool. And then, yeah, it felt like about two weeks later we were interviewing people. So there wasn't a lot of pre-production mm. on our side. There was a lot of post-production as a result. So that's why it then took another five years really to, to kind of edit yeah. it. Because we didn't have any money, so. Wow. And a lot of kind of follow-up interviews to kind of dig a bit deeper. And as we found more characters, mm. um, yeah. So that's kind of why it took years and because it was an unfunded project at the time and we had day jobs and Harry went off to animation school and you know all sorts of things that we got up to in the middle. Yeah um because I looked so um Sean you've made another documentary before but Harry this is I think your first project is that right? Um I, I mean I do more like artist moving image. Oh no hang on sorry it's Harry. Yeah. Harry's sorry yeah Harry's done um, so I've been on IMDb, Aliens Unzip documentary. <laughs> oh, that was just a stupid thing that I made with my friend. It's not a real thing. I don't know how that's ended up on IMDb. That was, it was a big hit in the um, MEN news, though, wasn't it? Because that was the spoof alien story. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I am the creator of the Salford <laughs> Alien. That, that went viral. And that was just my mate wrapped in cling film running around the park. But I did go, oh, yeah, I studied film at uni. So I did a few, like, little short bits and bobs and... Um, but mostly make music videos, like really, really crazy punky music videos and stuff. But no, I'd never made a documentary feature. I'd never even made a documentary short apart from, you know, the little things that you do at uni. So yeah, we were very fresh yeah. to it. Sean's got a background in photography. So that yeah. obviously helped. Um, so we just kind of pooled our skills and then kind of learned on the job. And Siobhan had never produced a film or thought about making a film at all. And now she's running her own production company. I was going to say, in between, she's been able to do quite a few projects, while this has obviously been the long haul that's kind of, I guess, spanned all the time since. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in terms of, did you think it was going to take this long and be this tough when you started out? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but on the flip side, yeah. I never would have imagined. I mean, I knew that I cared about it and I wanted other people to care about it. But just the last few days of, you know, from Wednesday just gone, like the press started to see it. And today we've got the world premiere and the reaction has just completely blown me away because it's, you know, for, yeah, again, an unsupported, unfunded kind of DIY project, you know, like 
we literally edited it in our, yeah I edited it in my bedroom and Sean edited yeah. it in their office where they are now you know yeah. running up and down the road with little hard drives and things like just yeah we, yeah. we stole a camera we didn't have a decent you know didn't have a proper tripod we yeah. I mean we both went to film school but you know we've had a chain of shit jobs and then I got some good archive jobs but they're all not making films so yeah the reaction is what's kind of yeah after all of that pain of so long it's been totally worth it yeah I think there was a sense of like oh we bit off more than we can chew quite a few times yeah and we did have to chew quite hard didn't we <laughs> yeah <laughs> what were the moments that made you feel like you bit off more than you could chew um I guess like I think one of the first ones for me was when we came back from the first round of interviewing and like we just had like 20 hours worth of interview and I was like oh hang on a minute we need to kind of make this into a, a story now and started just like transcribing everything and just be like I'm going to be here for a million years that I think that's yeah. one of the things that maybe because like how are we gonna get from this we, we kind of knew the things that we wanted to talk about Sean had a good idea about um, some of the definite topics that she wanted to talk about. Siobhan had an idea. I was kind of the one who was a bit like, I'm not sure what's going on. So I was reading through all the transcripts, like making all these notes, like who, who's connected to who, who knows who, what's going on and trying to trace this path. And at one point I was just like, this is a crazy web of lesbians. I can't get my head yeah. out. Oh, they kind of referenced that in the documentary, didn't yeah. you? Like that, that, so you were literally doing the same thing. You're like, how do we connect all these people? That actually, that I did another version of that when I was animating of the L word chart that was actually true. That actually, I went through the yeah, interview. Yeah, a bit libelous, and, wasn't it? Yeah, I reconstructed it, but there was a few people that maybe didn't want to be mentioned in the film, and there were a few people who may have sued us if we mentioned them in the film. So I had to kind of change a few names around. But Elliot, the composer, was like, it's fine, honey, I shagged everyone, so just put me in there. And <laughs> oh, excellent. Um, and what would you say is a highlight though I mean for me I find and I'm not surprised there's so much interest because we don't get taught this stuff at school and it's invisible history so mm. I'm eternally grateful that you've put this to screen because we need to know what's happened these people <clears throat> are for us you know it's really important it was slightly soul destroying that some of the things I don't feel like changed much I think they I think the the, the 80s lesbians that you've interviewed and, and people you've interviewed were kind of like we've come so far and I'm like in some ways yes yeah. and in some ways I'm sitting here and going we're in exactly the same position yeah. yes around us the fluffiness is slightly better but at the core some yeah. of these issues still exist and I think that's important as well to show people like you feel like we've had so much progress it takes documentaries like this to kind of go have we really like yeah. you can see to pick out what has progressed and what hasn't um, yeah, it does leave you with a bit of a question. I think when we started the film, things were, I mean, <clears throat> it's always difficult, but I think, I feel like things have got drastically worse in the last few years um, that we've been making the film, um, uh, particularly around sort of trans rights and things like that. It's, it's been like appalling what's been going on. And I think or oh, maybe I've just become more aware of it, but yeah, it's it sort of, I think we couldn't, if we'd have gone into all of that, we would have ended up having to make another film on top. We did interview yeah. some younger people that we didn't end up using in the film. I think exactly what, yeah, like Naomi, what you're, you took from it is exactly what we want. It's like for people to make those connections rather than have us spell it out. Because like our kind of like methodology was very much like a, an oral history kind of perspective. Like we want to empower these these people to tell the story in their words, and we're just crafting that arc. Um, so we you know we can see these glare you know like the debate in the middle of the film, like you know the pointless kind of like it's self defeating debating about something that shouldn't be debated. I mean it, that that is an obvious comparison to make. It doesn't need you know a, a narrator to point that out yeah. hopefully everyone can leave with the from the film thinking and making those connections and having conversations about it I think we did want to leave people with a feeling of yes there is a lot to do but look there was a lot to do in the 80s yeah. and a lot got done and we've still got a lot to do but it, ha it can be done I think that was the thing to try to yeah leave on 
on a, on a kind of a high. And these are all, you know, these are people who are, yeah, in their 50s and things. Who, that for them, the world has moved on. But there's a whole load of other stuff now that we still need to talk about. Sure. I think that made the film really special because while there are still so many problems that my generation faced that um, that indeed the rebel dykes faced that are kind of exactly the same just kind of and I said this before it's just like with, with like a different hat on but one thing that I thought was really special was the way that you you really captured this moment in time so that for younger viewers watching it's like a oh my god that's so cool I can't believe this but you also managed to go into detail about like that it wasn't it's not that you should be jealous or that you should wish you were from that time because there actually was a lot of issues especially of, around go, just going out and like being in, in a public space. Yeah the, the level of street harassment I mean we we've still as queers grown up with that and had instances of that in our lives but the degree in the stories that we were hearing I would definitely say that must have been a lot you know a lot worse and obviously we had you know things like the National Front openly in the streets all the time from you know throughout the 80s so there would be you know much more difficult lives but on the flip side um we cover you know like the squatting story and yeah. things you know when you're vacation <laughs> in London it's really hard to imagine that any of us would have managed to got away with what they well, amazing yeah. you know yeah. tv i think that helped a lot like they could yeah. just yeah but they're, they're, it's just a different time i'm glad that you feel like we captured that time i think we talked a lot it wasn't just that we interviewed people because there was this research group on facebook mm. as well there was like 150 people who were around at the time and i was in other groups as well myself um one called back to the bell on facebook and stuff just about the bell pub and i was in some squatters groups and things so i was constantly myself and i know shana well um just looking at images and talking to people who were there at the time so and also because it feels quite similar to like our like little underground culture that we were kind of baby queers in, in Manchester, yeah. you know it's well, like that, there is a similar yeah. feel to that's i mean that's how we know each other is from being in a band years ago like so it's the music scene and mm -hmm. like i guess there is a direct link when you think about that like that post-punk kind of you know all these amazing bands like debbie smith and elliot and sister george and and then all you hear about is Riot Girl in 90s and pro-sex feminism from that point. So it was like, okay, let's just make that link and bring it further back for everyone so that they can, you know, bring that into context. You know, like yeah. London was the hub and all of these amazing rebel dykes. There was a scene in Berlin, there was a scene in San Francisco, but it was all interconnected and much earlier in the 80s than people are talking about. Yeah, I think that's what I found really interesting. And actually there were there were times when I was like, oh my God, I'm really grateful I'm now. But there were times as well when I was like, you know, it would have been so much easier then. I feel like, as you say, like you could squat, you could protest. I feel like those rights, they're gone and they're going. And I think that, that makes it so relevant right now with the kind of all these rights being stripped away. I think, you know, we wonder why we're disconnected as a community. It's because there's so much red tape keeping us apart. Um, and so it was really interesting to see that kind of difference. And it was nice that it was referenced as well. It's like, you know, well, we could do this in the past and you can't do it now. And so that's actually, again, a really key piece of information for people to realise, like, we think it's progress, but is it progress when rights are removed that actually helped a community that was marginalised to come together? No, that's actually repression. So yeah. I'm hoping it will open people's minds in that sense. Especially when you think about how, I think Lisa Power kind of mentions it towards the end of the film, how it's like more about like queer assimilation. It's like, you know the things that that are allowed they're you know like uh gay marriage things like that like the the acceptable face of gayness or something yeah, and you know it's so acceptable now she says it we're yeah. losing all our edges and i think we wanted that to be a bit of a call to people to say hey you know you may need to rebel again yeah you know I mean, it's harder now because things are becoming as you say increasingly draconian i mean I could not have, I mean, in the last year, I mean, no one could have anticipated what, what's been going, I mean, but let's not get to get, talk about how we're creeping, <laughs> shall we? But yeah, you know, but I've no, lost my thread because I'm so stressed about it. <laughs> no, one thing I will 
I will say though is that um like there were, like you, uh, of course like you did touch on like oh I feel like we, we don't get to be rebels anymore because we actually have gay marriage but I would disagree I think there's so much that we still have to fight for and I I know that like myself and my friends have that drive behind us and that's why watching the film just made me feel overwhelmingly like sp like inspired and see <laughs> that is exactly what we want it's a subliminal message yeah. to go in the street <laughs> and, yeah. and mobilize yes. and mobilize yeah because we are back to that now so we need to <laughs> no, that, no that's awesome that you do feel like that and I know I know I'm like I still think of myself as a young person and then I meet obviously people who are 20 years younger who are young people and I'm like oh I'm not a young person but I, when I see young young people young young people yeah. now I'm just like wow you guys are so switched on yeah so switched on and so like considerate of each other like in a way that like it didn't even occur to us you know um and I I really think that things are going to change because yeah of the way that young people are now networking and talking to each other and really trying to build. The thing that was starting in, in the 80s, you know, this really true intersectionality and true kind of like, yeah, actually pro-sex feminism and actually yeah. inclusive feminism. And I, I don't know, I'm going off on one, sorry. <laughs> I guess it's like, cause we're kind of like, I mean, we're a generation after the Rebel Dykes, but we're kind of like between that generation that you've kind of, you're talking about there because it's like say particularly with the section 28 issue like literally my entire schooling took place while section 28 was in place yeah, and, me that, too. Like, yeah. and I don't know about you but the you know the shame and the kind of like devastation that that actually brought when you can't come out mm -hmm. um is something that you know stays with you and just yeah I think no nope. I think it's interesting now for people that can go to school and be able to talk about this. And I just think that that, that, is, that progress is amazing, that no one should have to go through that. Yeah, I think, yeah, I agree. It was like, um, I, I kind of, I'm in that point where I'm like, either I wish I was born earlier to have gone, th had the gateways and those kind of venues or later, yeah. I feel like I, I'm in that kind of space where I was like, it was just a bit shit. And, <laughs> and also just, I feel like, I don't know what went wrong. I don't know what happened, but like we've lost that kind of, maybe it is because everyone was focusing on um, a lot of the gay male issues that were, I think, much tougher. I think for women, we had a little bit easier because a lot of stuff wasn't directly focused at us. But I think as women, we kind of just took off, like took our eyes off the road a bit and just went, oh, it's not too bad. And so there's like a generation where we just kind of lost that drive and we were like, it's not too bad for us. Like they've got it worse. So let's just let them get on with it. And we kind of just stepped back, I feel like. Um, and we've lost that right. drive we've lost that interest and that's where, why we're invisible as well because we're not yeah. taking up space like everyone else is how and I'm hoping this documentary will help people to really kind of see that and go I can take up space again and also because you don't have to do it illegally as well you can just do it on social media you can just do it in your life but you have to make the conscious choice to do that yeah you, mm. because if you yeah you're right if you passively kind of go along with how things are yeah you end up you do end up getting um, forgotten and I think yeah I mean we, we talk a lot about I mean there's lesbian erasure and there's bisexual erasure and I'm I'm bi and, and and it's it's a weird thing like to to be in that kind of well I guess pan is the is the proper word for it now but yeah it's you know that kind of whole thing of like I don't exist I'm a non-binary bisexual but I don't exist and it's like lesbians they get like pushed to one side and like you know a lot of us AFAB queers we're just not you know it still feels like we're not really where we should be because I mean the amazing contributions that yeah. queer women and AFAB people have been making to like queer culture so I'm glad that we were able to show some of that yes because <sighs> it's not all about the lads is it <laughs> as well like not gonna lie like the gays have done good good for us you know and the bisexual <laughs> men and the non-binary men and trans men you know but time for us now no i am very excited for like gen z to see this especially because i'm i'm 24 i so i'm not 
I'm, I'm just a little bit past the mark and I got TikTok like within the past year and I was a bit like I don't really understand it but then <laughs> there is there is like a, a new generation of like voices coming through that are so passionate about being a lesbian and like being bisexual and like excellent I love the way that social media has enabled people around the world to meet in this way and I think like your film and for that audience being able to see your film like will make them feel incredibly powered because like you've touched on um because I've done a film degree <laughs> as well I did film um so um <laughs> I was like old Hollywood and how like you know everyone was like low-key a bit gay and like it's so easy for us or like anybody to look back and be like wow I wish I had like a little taste of that it sounded great but th that's the thing like you always you always want what you don't have and I I think in I think that's interesting when you bring up like old Hollywood it's like for so long we've had to just survive on like the subtext or you know looking for those snippets or like a, a glance between two like female characters or you know in a film and it's like I feel like we're amping up now and it's like okay we've made a documentary about this like who's gonna make a you know a tv show about it who's gonna set it in you know I'd watch that. reaction story how amazing yeah. would that be yeah so talking of that so obviously this is now done I mean it's not done it's just starting its life like you've you've finally brought it to the audience it's starting a film festival run it's being released um definitely in the UK later in the year and hopefully further afield it's so it's kind of going to take a life of its own on now so do, are you planning like has this put you off or has it inspired you <laughs> want to do more what's what's next for Harry and Sean like what's what's your kind of thoughts on on after this I've got a job now as an animator and I'm really excited about that because that's I became an animator because of Revel Dykes and obviously you can see, kind of see me learning on the screen it's quite scrappy but you know it's fine for the aesthetic I guess but now I am an animator and, and, and I'm working in education and I'm absolutely loving that so I would love to do something actually a bit light and uh, just after uh, yeah. just <laughs> for myself you know like maybe something about an animal or something um but then later on I'd like to do a documentary about my grandma and Derek Jarman who lived two doors from each other in Dungeness and I, and I think there's a story to be told there about um yeah just the interesting position I find myself in as a queer artist Jarman fan who comes from a family of fisher people who are being kind of gentrified out of their homes by the art crowd and where do I sit with that and who do I side with and is it my kind of homophobic and you actually met him didn't, or didn't you it? when you when you were really little didn't you meet him yeah and he was a great man in a dressing gown and I didn't know what was going on and now I'm like holy shit that was Terry Chan <laughs> years <laughs> later I saw his films because he was just a funny man who lived down the road yeah. you know yeah. my nan met Kelda Swinton and thought it was his daughter because she had no clue what was going on <laughs> so yeah, so there's a film to be made there. Yeah. I feel when, when we yeah. recover from the Bull Dykes. What are you going to do, Williams? Well, this is it. I mean, I've been working for like over ten years in film and video and sound archives. And you've mm. been talking about Jarman. We did like restorations of his films and you know all sorts. So I've been doing that for quite a long time, and now I've got about a year left on my contract. So that my kind of creativity has had to be around a full-time job yeah. um and I didn't have time to do other projects only this um so I I love documentary I love queer history mm -hmm. and I really want to do another doc another feature um I particularly like using artists moving images like a strategy to kind of bring like untold stories to life and I do that currently in like little shorts and things like that but um I basically need to up my game and submit things and make more and my long-term ambition I think is to do a PhD that is looking at heritage and film and yeah queer stories. Well hopefully the success of Rebel Dykes will help make it easier for you to make content I mean obviously it's always so much easier when you've got a kind of not even a proof of concept but evidence of what you can do and yeah. that there's an audience behind it that makes things a lot easier and I think that's what I love about kind of every kind of queer women's film that happens helps the next one 
And it's about making sure the audience know they need to share this when they find it and tell their friends about it because it does help. And it is not easy to make this content. It should be. Um, yeah. But hopefully it means the next project will be easier to and make. Also, yeah, um, I guess as, as unproven filmmakers as well, that yeah. was, yeah, it's hard. You can't really get things funded. They want, it's almost like they want to take your idea and give it to, you know, someone else who's made a film before. Whereas That's now we've made a film. Like, so. replace, director, replace the producer, replace everybody. And it's like, well, if you replace yeah. everybody, it will not be the same film, will it? Um, <laughs> but also the other thing is that these stories don't, um, get told and they don't get these films don't get made and and, and yeah. sometimes you have to kind of do it yourself and so we did but um yeah I remember going to an event at the BFI who've been quite supportive of us um in terms of sort of like moral support and giving us a bit of a platform but we went to the yeah I went to an event called where are the lesbians and that was five years ago and I was like well they're here in my folder and I'm gonna make a film about it yeah give, give <laughs> us some money yeah but um yeah <laughs> You know, still, it, I think people, investors and gatekeepers and people who've got their yeah. hands on the tail, they kind of go, oh, I don't know, that's a bit niche. Yeah. It's not, that's, is it? Yeah. There's something for everyone in this story, surely. Yeah. We've had that, that's, that's exactly why I started Lesbian. I got tired of that excuse of hearing people saying, I'll go for funding and I get told there's no paying audience for lesbian film. I'm like, there is. They're pirating it because it's not being distributed. I'm like, that's the reason. And because their friend sends them a link and they trust their friends. So, you know, it's about pro pro proving women audience. So again, that in itself is a form of us needing to step up to say, actually, I'm going to use my social media to say that I pay for film. I watch film. I'm a fan of film. I am a lesbian. I'm a bi queer woman. I exist. And we need to create that data. So when you go for that funding and they go, oh, there's no audience, you can go, well, actually there is. And here's my data. And that's what we've always been missing is the evidence and without evidence everyone can always give you an excuse and you've got nothing to push back with and I'm like we, we are definitely an audience but we're invisible because we don't have spaces physical spaces to, to come together we're also quite different as an audience you know, I mean age range interests experiences so it's very hard to market to us and I think that also is one of the barriers to distribution it's like well, how do you reach a, a lesbian by queer woman it's like that's like saying how to reach a woman it's that's yeah. not enough you have to be able to kind of target and I think most distributors don't understand the market so they don't take the film and you've got all these layers of issues um, but as I say then every audience member that finds it if they share it it's down to us as an audience sharing the films with our friends no one else can do it as well as we can and organizations um, like your you know people like you who are actually trying to champion exactly these kind of films are really important you know and and yeah so let's all keep doing it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's amazing how many women are like, oh, I love lesbian film. And then you're like, you know, what have you seen more recently? And they're like, Carol, and I'm, but I'm a chill. And I'm like, that's not that, oh my word. I'm like, there are more films out there. So I think it is about, you know, where do you find them? How do you find them? We need to make it easier for people to find the films. And luckily when you have films like Rebel Dykes, it, it's got so many people involved in it that it's going to take on a life its own and actually it's a good example that when the community gets behind a film and so it'll be a really good case study hopefully as well for other filmmakers to say look as long as you can find your audience and you can empower them they'll share it and that's actually how your film gets out there so I think there's and documentaries I think that's the reason they're so powerful it's because we do sit there and go well I didn't know any of this before um, and so it, it has a different life, I feel like, queer documentaries. There was another crowdfunder at the beginning of lockdown for another kind of interviewing and featuring queer women. And it just died a death because it was right at the beginning of lockdown. And I was, I was a bit like, crazy. what's happened? Where's it going to go? Like, you know, but also we shouldn't be crowdfunding these films. We should be no. able to get like funding. Yeah. You know, there's funding out there for kind of archive content and historical content. How do we prove to them that our stories are worth telling? Yeah. And that's the challenge because yeah. they're making stories about stuff that you do get taught in school and it's like a sixth, seventh, eighth version of history. And I'm like, what about the stories that have not been told? Yeah. So I'm really happy that you've made this. It's finally been created. Um, and I can't wait for people to see it really and to tell their friends about it as well. I think I'm so glad that, um, that I mean, it's, it's down to me, Sean and Siobhan who saw how important it was. And I'm, I'm so glad to have been able to help shape it. The three of us. Yes, what but that, that's, you had that understanding of the history <laughs> and the context and Siobhan was bloody there. So between yeah. you two kind of understood the significance and I was kind of like, okay, I guess we're doing this. 
<laughs> and I'm so glad that we did do it and we did stick with it and, and we made it happen because it, yeah. yeah it, and yeah, like, it, it, oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say. Well, it'll prove that there is an audience. Exactly. And um, it was just basically to do justice to their story. So the fact that the Rebel Dykes themselves seem to really bloody love it, then that was enough for us anyway. And this is just icing on the cake now. Yeah. No reviews no. like you wrote. So thank you. <laughs> it's nice that the Rebel Dykes themselves have all said, yeah, no, I like that film and it, and it does feel right and it does speak to me. And and I just thought, oh, good. Because I think that was the other thing is like, oh, if I mess this up, if we mess this up, if any of us mess up, I'm going to have like a hundred, like, <laughs> pretty ferocious <laughs> women, some of whom are going to come on in leather and bikes. And that might be a bit sexy, but also quite scary. Like, if I could. <laughs> You sound like they want you want them to come. Mm. Yeah, actually, there are times when I'm like, shall I just call up my 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 lesbian motorcycle mamas and get them to come and rescue me? Yeah. <laughs> no, honestly, um, I I feel really just passionate about keeping like moments of queer history alive and like that's why I referenced old Hollywood because like m most of the time you don't hear about that unless you look into it and for a and especially like um pre-Stonewall um it, like queer people in pre-Stonewall and then between like between Stonewall and the AIDS crisis like there's so many gaps in time where like we have a vague idea of what it was like but there's not a lot of stories about it and that's why this film is so special because I'm it, it, it's so easily like if people hadn't have come together and were like yeah let's let's do this okay <laughs> like you guys like it, it it could have been lost and I think it's so important um for everybody to see not just younger audiences because yeah. it's just a reminder that lesbians have well dykes and queer people have just always been powerful yeah. and w weirdly I was ju just thinking then about how there's this weird short period of time in the early 90s where the rebel dykes and their look became kind of ripped off and so cool like there were people with shaved heads and jackets and that's all thought of as as removed from them in a way like you know as like like the Madonna sex book like yeah that wouldn't have happened if Della Grace Volcano hadn't done Love Bites. And it's so mm -hmm. obvious, but it's just like, it becomes ubiquitous as the wrong story, the wrong narrative, doesn't it? If it's not told. Yeah. yeah. I think it's great. You've really shown that you've, you've, you've not necessarily experienced, you've not lived this yourself, but you've worked with a team and you've made sure that the voices are there. So you've had Siobhan producing, who, as you say, was there. And it shows that anyone can be a filmmaker and cover this past and, you don't have to have been specifically in this life to tell that story but obviously it is important to make sure that you interview the right people and have the, the resources available to make sure it's authentic and I think that as you say if the fact is that everyone who's watched it loves it that means you've done a really good job as doing that you know you've you've kind of brought the history into the present day and that's something that's really impressive and so congratulations as for, for a first feature documentary for both of you with all of the challenges around funding and you know and also finding the information like I've seen Siobhan messaging going who's this person in this photo so many times yeah. Yeah. Me like, Siobhan and, and Sean to a lesser extent but me mostly yeah. because um I was doing that part of the edit where it was in the clubs and things and I was just like who's this who's this who's this and she's like actually I don't know that could be like yeah. 10 women everyone had the same hairdo it's a fuzzy <laughs> photo I've got no I think that there was a photo which I thought was Siobhan that Siobhan thought was her that turned out to be someone else just stuff like that it's just like oh my goodness and, like, and some it's of the video is group, you know the people there that were, yeah. were just on the internet and why it's so important to make friends with the rebel dykes and like we I mean yeah. it was still making in a kind of feminist mode it was very lots of discussion lots of doing you know everyone got their transcripts everybody we was discussed a lot you know people were this is like telling your story we're not coming in here imposing yeah. narrative on you you tell us what you want to tell us and then we'll somehow fashion it into a story and the, the ethics of the fact that we're using footage that was basically filmed in a private sex club so we can only really show the faces of the people who've signed that off yeah. so you know 
the yeah. some of the quality we've uh, we've added glitches and things to like hide people <laughs> that we can't track because yeah that's what we've got to do you know yeah <laughs> yeah it was yeah it's it, a bit of a real undertaking but I'm glad we did it yeah documentaries I think people just go oh, this is great but like the work that goes behind a documentary and as you say signing off every single visual and asset to say that you've really allocated the right kind of you know sign off that you've got the rights to use the images the people in them it's not easy so you know as I say well done for both of you it's a great project it's a real testament of a great first feature and I hope that means that you will you know find it easier to make future content and I do hope you, you choose to do that because we need those stories and it needs people who do really respect the topic and the people um, and you should be very proud of what you've produced and it's totally worthwhile <laughs> um, yeah so I'm not surprised at all you've got good reviews and I think they'll just keep continuing to come through thank you so so much Thank you. That's... Yeah. Um, we're going to have to wrap up because otherwise you're going to be in trouble for being late for the world premiere. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you're, ten, you're eight minutes. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. right. No, no, it's fine. Oh, yeah. so, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today to talk through the process and, and how you got this made. Um, it's really interesting to talk about a bit of behind the scenes. I think, as I say, a lot of people will enjoy this, but it's nice to hear how it came about so thank you so much yeah. thank you Kat for reviewing and for joining with the questions today thank you Kat um, really like I said it's my pleasure honestly <laughs> it's it's been a joy it's such a wonderful film I and I just I think <laughs> it's amazing <laughs>